Good afternoon. My name is Gint Krillicus, and I'm an associate attorney here at Minute Law Firm. Um, today we have Kathleen Bentley with us, and she's going to talk a little bit about continuous alcohol monitoring. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, thank you. So, starting off, can you just kind of tell us what exactly is continuous alcohol monitoring? Um, it's, a, it's an ankle monitor this is, that is, is worn 24-7, uh, and what it does is it tests for alcohol consumption through the perspiration. It tests, takes a body temperature reading, and there's an infrared sensor in place that measures the distance between the leg and the bracelet, also the texture of the skin. And um, the data stays stored in the bracelet mm -hmm. until it is transmitted through a device that we provide. Okay. And so why do people normally wear it? Is it something that's ordered by the court or is it something people voluntarily decide to wear? How does that work? A lot of people volunteer to wear it to provide mitigating evidence okay. at their DWI mm -hmm. hearing. Right. Some folks are ordered by the court to wear it as a part of probation. Mm -hmm. We even have folks that wear it to prove abstinence when they uh, go to their license restoration okay. hearing. Okay. And, I mean, you briefly talked about it a little bit, but can, do you have a little bit more about how the device works a little bit more in depth? Sure, or, yeah. sure. It's the, the bracelet's taking in the perspiration that we put off. We're always putting off a little bit of vapor. Right. There's a fuel cell inside that um, will detect alcohol or other substances. Um, the data is transmitted to the data analysts certified and trained at the manufacturer location right, right. and these people look at the readings mm -hmm. for a for say a confirmed drinking event there's criteria that has to be met right the, the bracelet is not confirming a drinking event okay. the data analysts are looking at the data that they got from the bracelet to confirm a drinking event so after the fact after the fact okay. yeah okay and when a person wears the device, how, how noticeable is it? It's, if you're wearing any kind of slacks or trousers or blue jeans, it's not noticeable. We have folks who wear work boots, men in right. different lines of work that wear the work boot, and they can wear their boot over that bracelet. Okay, so it's pretty unobtrusive. Right, right. and you can wear a sock over top of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, a little bit about the logistics of the device. Um, is it waterproof? Like because I assume once you put it on, you can't easily take it off. So can a client um, take a shower or go swimming with it? They How can does... shower. Okay. The bottom of the bracelet is a little drain. Oh, okay. So if they shower, the water can come out, uh, cannot submerge it, so there are no baths, no swimming, no water sports. Okay, so no actual submersion. Right. Okay. Um, and it's typically worn on what part of the body? It's worn just above the ankle. Mm -hmm. like to have it an inch to two inches above the ankle bone for comfort. Okay. And so I guess it depends kind of on the circumstances, but once it's put on, does the individual have control over, say, adjusting it, or um, how exactly does that work? They can't remove the bracelet. Right. Um, but they can. What I tell folks is, because I'm going to back up, they need to have a snug fit at all times. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple reasons for that, and I'll go into that more. But if they lower the bracelet to a thinner part of their ankle, they can turn that bracelet so that this testing component here rests either on the outside of the leg, the back of the leg, or even on the inside. Right. As long as it's touching the skin and okay. fitting snug. Okay. Or how reliable are these devices? Um, so the moment you consume any form of alcohol, does it immediately read it? Or is it, you know, a 10 minute process later? Or how, how does that work? Well, because it's tested, if, if alcohol is detected, it's going to be taking those readings um, and trans every 30 minutes and transmitting the data immediately, or at least attempting to mm -hmm. transmit the data immediately. Um, if a client's drinking and not uploading, of course, then we're not going to know that they're drinking. Mm -hmm. um, for somebody who is court-ordered to the bracelet, if they're mandated to the bracelet, we require that they provide an upload every day. Okay. If they've missed an upload, if 24 hours go by and there hasn't been an upload, they get a soft call from, from me mm -hmm. as a reminder, 
maybe some uh, re-education on the upload process. Okay. And so does this device detect any other substances besides alcohol? Um, any kind of drugs or narcotics, or is it solely just alcohol? It's alcohol, but it's also will detect what we call outside interference. In other words, uh, if somebody sprayed the carpet, the bedding, mm -hmm. or the furniture down with the breeze and then plopped down on the couch, mm -hmm. the bracelet's going to pick that up. Right. But the readings that are generated are going to look different okay. than a consumption event. Right. Um, kind, of, kind of to go along with that, is there any possibility of producing any kind of false positive or maybe a false notification of alcohol? Well, the device is going to alert that something's been detected. Mm -hmm. We've had bartenders and waitresses using the bracelet, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, alcohol can get spilt. Right. The reading then, when the bracelet picked that up, rather than seeing a bell curve for an absorption confirmed drinking event, you're going to see it shoot straight up. Just a spike. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how, how sensitive is this device? Could certain foods or liquids, like mouthwash or something, potentially set off a detection, or is that not really no. a problem? No. It's not. Okay. And the contract that we provide, we say stay away from mouthwash and, and foods that contain alcohol, but after doing this for over 10 years, mm -hmm. I will tell clients, you know, you can use your mouthwash. If you drink your mouthwash <laughs> and there's alcohol, you're drinking alcohol. Right. But if you're gargling and a little trickles down your throat, it's not enough to pass through the system. Okay. To, to be detected. So trace amounts are probably right. not going to cause an issue. Um, so can you kind of walk us through the process of what happens once the device detects um, a positive uh, indication of alcohol? A lot of times the data analysts will contact me and tell me alcohol has been detected. Mm -hmm. um, it's not been confirmed as alcohol consumption at this point and they'll ask me to call the client and find out what they were doing, what their activities were during the time frame of this alert. Right. Um, and I relay that back to the data analysts. Mm -hmm. And there are times when that resolves the issue. Mm -hmm. There are other times when it confirms a drinking event. Okay. Um, so let's kind of get into the, the actual device, some of the details. So what type of um, maintenance is required? So when a client gets this device, what do they have to do? Maybe is it daily or weekly? Um, how does that work? There's, there's no maintenance required mm -hmm. on their part. The bracelet, besides testing for the alcohol and the other tests that it provides, it does a self-diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So if, say, the battery is running low, mm -hmm. um, we get notification. Right. And there's about a 10-day window there mm -hmm. when that notification comes in. So I have plenty of time to get with the client, mm -hmm. make arrangements to go ahead and replace that battery. Okay. And there's no charge to the client for that. Okay. Um, so does the client have to charge it every night or is it just, does it have a long battery, anything along those lines? They don't have to do any charging for the bracelet. Uh -huh. the, the base station, which is the device that transmits the data, mm -hmm. needs, has a rechargeable battery. Okay. But we do tell clients Leave this plugged in at all times. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's get into a little bit about the, uh, the transmission of this data. Um, mm -hmm. How exactly does that work? The bracelet is woken up, if you will, with a magnet. Mm -hmm. When that happens, it prompts the bracelet to send its data to the base station. Uh -huh. That's a manual upload. We can also set up automatic uploads. Okay. So somebody's asleep at 2 a.m., they have this set up in the bedroom. Right. At 2 a.m., is this is all going to happen automatically. The data is sent to the base station. Mm -hmm. The data is transmitted from the base station in one of three ways. One is using a regular landline, the old-fashioned telephone right. jack. The second way is use if you've got internet access with the router. Mm -hmm. Let me just plug this device this Direct. into the to the router, mm -hmm. and then the third way is using a wireless device, somewhat like a hotspot. Oh, okay. Yeah. So through a cellular data network yes. or something along those lines. And so when a client gets this bracelet, 
are they given an option of all three, or do you just pick one? How, how does that work? I always start with, do they have a landline? Mm -hmm. Because that's $10 a day, it's less expensive for them. Right. You kind of touched on it briefly, the uh, the fees. Um, let's talk about how much this device costs. Sure. Um, so, how much per day is it to wear a continuous alcohol monitor or bracelet? The fee's based on how the data is transmitted. Okay. So again, if we're using the landline, mm -hmm. it's $10 per day is how it breaks down. If they're going to use the internet mm -hmm. with the ethernet cable, it's $11 a day. If they need to use our multi-connect device, then it's $12 a day. Okay. And there's an, a $75 installation fee. Okay. Um, pay, the first payment is the installation fee. And for volunteers, the first 30 days of monitoring. Mm -hmm. Somebody mandated to the bracelet pays the first 14 days okay. plus the 75. And is there a any kind of removal fee after? No. no. Okay. Um, so what happens if, say, the device breaks or um, something along the lines, maybe the client accidentally damages it? Is there any kind of um, fee for that or how exactly does that work? Well, in the time that I've been doing this, I haven't seen anybody accidentally damage the bracelet. It's a pretty sturdy right. bracelet. Um, if somebody deliberately damages the bracelet, um, we would certainly attempt to collect the price of the bracelet, $1,400. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, what we see more of is somebody cutting the strap. Because yeah, okay. the strap is hot, um, we charge for the replacement oh, of that strap. strap. Okay. Yeah. And kind of going off of that, how does, I mean, you said the device is very durable. Um, is it affected at all by high or low temperatures, humidity, anything along mm -hmm. those lines? No. So yeah. pretty durable. Yeah. We had a fella down in Jacksonville, North Carolina, who worked on the roofs. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and it was summertime. And so there was a lot of perspiration, a lot of heat. Right. It didn't affect the thing. Okay, so pretty durable. Yeah. A, another violation, confirmed violation, is something that's placed between the leg and the bracelet for eight hours or longer. Mm -hmm. So kind of like a barrier. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, and so what, I guess it depends on whether this is a voluntary person who's wearing it or if it's mandated, what are the consequences of a positive reading, typically? If it's somebody that's mandated and, and on probation, I'm providing that violation report to them, and what they do with that is up to them. Right, right. Somebody who's wearing the bracelet voluntarily, you know, it's their data. Mm -hmm. I actually need to get permission from the client to provide any report to their attorney. Okay. So if I provide a, a violation report to the attorney, then that's a discussion between the client and the attorney. Okay. If it's a mandated order to wear this bracelet and there is a positive indication, are there typically any kind of additional criminal implications for this or is that kind of out of your realm of... Um... A bit, but what I've seen is violation of probation. Mm -hmm. um, I've also seen probation officers give a client you know, a second chance. Mm -hmm. There's a certain percentage of clients who will test the system. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and when they realize, when I let them know that I know when they started drinking, mm -hmm. and I know when they quit drinking, when I know that level right. of information, they'll settle right in ah. <laughs> and, and become compliant. Yeah. Well, that's pretty much all the questions that I have for you. Thanks very much for coming out here. Thank you <laughs> for having me. Bye.